So, um, so this is a question uh, for the men uh, here and, and, and for the boys as well. Okay. So, how many of you have been in a fight? I'm talking going all the way back to childhood at school. Who's, who's been in a fight? Who's been in a bit of a scrap? Hands up. Yeah, that's good, good. I won't ask you what, if you've got a winning record. I just want to know. Okay, so yeah, uh, it's a, a normal thing. Boys get in scraps, um, and uh, if you're a teacher at school, you've probably broken up, broken up a few scraps in your time. If you're a parent, you've probably broken up two brothers or brothers and sisters going at it, right? And, um, but I wonder if you know uh, the unspoken rule of scraps of fights between boys and men. Any, any guesses? Okay, here it is. No matter how badly you're getting beaten, even if a golden opportunity presents itself, even if your back's against the wall and they're about to finish you off, you never, ever go below the belt. It's never, ever go below the belt. In fact, this rule is so golden, do you know it's even in the Bible? God even makes a law against this. You want to read it? Here it is. When men fight one another and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the hand of him who is beating him and puts out her hand and seizes him by the... I'm not going to say it. Then you shall cut off her hand. You shall show no compassion. God understands. He gets it. There's something about this rule and something about a male's vulnerability in this particular area, which actually unites all men. We won't strike each other in that area. You know what we call that? We call that the law of sympathy or the law of compassion. If I can feel what you feel, then I won't inflict that suffering on you. I feel it as if it's my own pain. A similar thing might be, say, for example, a woman who's pregnant. Say if you've had a baby before and you see a young mum with a big, be a big belly and you're like, I remember what that felt like, you know? And you, and you smile, don't you? And then you go to the nine months and they're giving birth and you're like, I remember what that felt like too. And your heart goes out, don't you? Doesn't it? That's what we call the law of sympathy. In fact, sympathy means this. It comes from the Greek, to suffer with. When we see someone go so, through something we've gone through, we wince, don't we? And we're more inclined to help that person as well because we feel our pain in them. Now, a simple translation of that word into Latin and then into English is compassio, to suffer with. And it's about compassion that I want to speak today. In fact, God talks about compassion, this law of compassion, through the Old Testament and into the New. It's a precious thing for him. We heard it in the psalm today, didn't we? The Lord is compassion and love. He reminds the people of Israel when they move into their new land of how to treat others. He says, you must not oppress the stranger. You know how the stranger feels, for you lived as strangers in the land of Egypt. Don't we do that with our children? You know when they're being, maybe they've been a bit mean to their brother or sister, and what do we say? We say, think how you would feel. In other words, what they're going through, try and put yourself in their position. Do you remember when it happened to you? God is always citing the law of sympathy, the law of compassion. And I think it's this law of compassion which helps us to understand the very, very strict demands of God in our first reading and the demands of Jesus in the gospel. Here it is. Jesus says, Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Who is holy in this place? It's a strict demand, isn't it? Some would say it is impossible. But you know what's even harder than that? You know what's even more of a challenge than that? It's something that in the A to B group we came up against a couple of weeks ago. Of all the demands of God, be holy for I am holy, no one had a problem with that. It was this command. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first part, you shall love your neighbor, that's fairly straightforward, isn't it? That wasn't a difficult thing. 
In our A to B group, nearly everyone had a difficulty with as yourself. How do we love ourselves? And if loving my neighbor is conditioned by how I love myself, how can I love my neighbor the way in which they deserve? What's wrong with the picture here? I think we generally have a very low opinion of ourselves, don't we? We don't think we cut the mustard. And yet, it's normally the people who have the lowest opinion of themselves who tend to be the ones who do the most good, who tend to be the ones who reach out the most to their brothers and sisters and, as Jesus says, to their enemies. I wonder why that is. I think it's got something to do with compassion. And it maybe throws light on what Jesus is really saying when he says in the Gospel today, be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, if we felt bad about ourselves before and then we heard that commandment, how much worse would we feel? And in fact, if Jesus is asking something that is impossible, do we have to obey it? Of course not. But he's not asking something that's impossible. He's asking for something which calls for our understanding. And if something in Scripture is hard to understand, we look around or what else Jesus has said. Now, in Luke's Gospel, Luke has a parallel story to this. The same story of the Beatitudes, so love your neighbour, love your enemy, and all of those things. But when Luke gets to this verse, he has a slightly different angle on what Jesus says. Instead of be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect, he says, be perfect compassionate as your father is compassionate in other words to be perfect and to be holy isn't to never get anything wrong but rather to identify in the sufferings of others your own brokenness and to reach out a hand because here's the thing i think we have a low opinion of ourselves because we tend to measure ourselves by our, how others have made us feel about ourselves. Isn't that true? So if you have a broken heart, or if you have a broken relationship, or in some cases, it's sad to say, broken bones or bruises, how someone's treated to you, that tends to be what you take on and how you see yourself. Well, Jesus changes it around completely. The law of compassion shows us just how lovable we are by how we identify in others' brokenness our own and how we reach out to heal the wounds that aren't healed within ourselves. In the preface today, so preface number two, which I'm going to pray before the Eucharistic prayer, it goes like this. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself... Jesus, and was born of the Virgin and went to the cross to give us unending life. God's compassion shows us how lovable we are. God became man so that he would feel everything that we feel, experience our experience of ourselves, our brokenness, our sinfulness, our weakness, and in a supreme act of compassion, reach out a hand in love, so that by his wounds, we would be healed. That's how we become perfect. That's how we experience our lovableness, by seeing in others our brokenness, and reaching out, as Jesus did, to bring healing. The season of Lent is upon us, isn't it? It starts this Wednesday. Who started to think about what they're going to give up for Lent? Anyone? Yeah, yeah we've got a few, uh, few people there. I am too. And, and, and that's kind of what we, how we see Lent, isn't it? It's uh, giving something up um, for a spiritual purpose and maybe if it's food for a physical purpose too. You know, there are fringe benefits to these things. God is a good God or that kind of thing. But it, normally it's a question, isn't it, of what am I going to give up, isn't it? 
You know, what am I going to give up? Why don't we change the emphasis in the last few days before Lent and ask not what am I going to give up and what is it for, but rather who am I going to give up for? In the space I make in my self-denial, what space do I make for the other? In other words, in what way is my offering an offering of compassion? Because I think that's where God wants to get us, isn't it? To fill us with compassion and love, like him. Simple example. Like we often, uh, we often um, give up a treat, let's like say if it's chocolate. Or maybe we give up food. Maybe we, we fast for a day a week in Lent, something like that. Think about it this way. When your belly's full, it's very hard or harder to sympathize or to have compassion for someone whose belly is empty. We might say, well, I've got plenty, I feel bad, but it's very hard to enter into the experience of one who doesn't have anything. But when your belly is empty, when you feel that gnawing in your stomach, when you know what hunger is, how much more deeply connected do you feel to the person who has no means of accessing food? How much more space does it make in your heart to reach out a hand so from our excess, from our plenty, we can give to those who have no means of their own? How much more do our acts of self-denial of our giving become an act of compassion? I think that's the challenge of this Lent. That's the challenge of life, because Lent is a microcosm of life. The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, wants us to enter into his compassion for us, his love for us, to show us how lovable we are. And by our acts of compassion, by our capacity from our own brokenness to suffer with, we might know the love God has for us on the cross and in the coming Easter celebrations might experience with him the joy of the resurrection. Amen.